For those of you who have been following us from the beginning, you will know that we have completed the discussion on the 18th chapters of the Bhagavad Gita and we are now looking at the titles or the epithets that are given to God in the Bhagavad Gita. So Sister Denise, very, very warm welcome. Great to have you back. Thank you. Um, I see uh, during the uh, Bhagavad Gita itself uh, from chapter to chapter, uh, Krishna, uh, slash God has been given many titles and I'm going to name these titles and I'd like you to tell us uh, what the significance of them mean because uh, if one looks at for example bristling head one um, it doesn't actually hold any meaning in the English language but um, uh, you would have to tell us what the meaning is uh, as uh, from a contextual perspective okay so the first term sister Denise is uh, Rishikesh so Rishikesh is also the name of one of the very famous pilgrimage places. So Rishikesh, uh, the bristling haired one, okay, Rishikesh refers to actually Shiva, who is mixed with Shankar, who is shown, you know, naked, is part of the Trimurti and is uh, indicated or the sign of him is the the bun of uh, uh, unkempt hair that's on the top that is the sign of the renunciate um, but it's also not really something that you would normally associate with Krishna the beautiful one who is the prince of the golden age with the peacock feathers in his crown so here I see a definite um, decoding needed here because you have Krishna, the beautiful form, and Rishikesh is not really a beautiful form at all. And uh, Achuta? Achuta means the one who has never fallen. And one of the things that we can say for a human being, and you always see Krishna in a human form, who is also known as Sham Sundar, the, the fair and the dark. So this is one who passes through all the different births, whereas Achuta means the one who has never fallen. This is again a reference to the incorporeal supreme soul who is not a human soul and who doesn't come into the cycle of birth and death. Uh, the next one is Madhav. So Madhav actually does refer to Krishna and so here definitely um, you have you know some of the epithets referring to the incorporeal one some of them referring to the most attractive one Krishna the one that we know as Krishna ya uh, Keshav Keshav, also the, the one with the beautiful hair. So this is in stark contrast to Rishikesh, mm. which is ugly hair. Mm. <laughs> and so uh, definitely uh, Keshav refers to the one uh, Krishna, that uh, the, the beautiful Krishna that we know. Govinda. Govind also refers to uh, Krishna, the, the, the prince, but uh, it's um, interesting, Govind, the one who looks after the cows. So the cows, you know in India cows are sacred and there is a symbolic value there as well. Uh, cows refer to women, the women who, um, who were taken care of. And so this, I think, in a way is, um, this word normally refers to Krishna, but I think it can also refer to him in his last birth as Brahma, where he does look after the women who he makes into the instruments. So Govind, um, usually you see the picture of Krishna with some very beautiful cows, but if you think of Krishna in terms of his function as a great king, uh, great kings don't normally spend time with cows. Mm, that, is, that is true, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Madhusudana. 
Uh, so this is uh, a, a reference to um, the destroyer of Mada, which is um, a demon. And so this would refer to um, Krishna. It can refer to Krishna as the one who destroys negativity. Um, again, uh, I would say it's referring in a sense to Arjuna because you see you have um, many areas where God is referring to Arjuna as his son. And so there you've established that relationship of the Supreme Soul and the soul and also the idea of the soul having passed through all of the births uh, who then has to achieve victory over the senses, victory over negativity. So it seems to me that this is a reference to that war, that inner war that we were talking about with Arjuna. The next one in my list is Janardhan. So uh, Janardhan means the agitator. And so that could refer to God who is trying to wake everybody up. Um, it can also refer to Arjuna who is the great leader of uh, the, the battle. And um, in brackets, we have a reference to Vishnu. So Vishnu, you see, Vishnu is very often thought of as God. Shiva is thought of as God, Krishna is thought of as God, and then Arjuna, the man. And you see, in the studies that we do in uh, Brahma Kumari's Raj Yoga, we're looking at the first birth as Krishna and the last birth as Brahma. Krishna also connected with Vishnu or Krishna is Vishnu and you very often see the image of Vishnu with out of his, um, his navel comes a lotus with Brahma on that lotus and then out of the navel of Brahma is another lotus with Vishnu on it. So to us this uh, is a reference to the passage through many births, where your first birth is as Vishnu or Krishna, the last birth is as Brahma, or again we would say Arjuna. And so he is definitely the best among men, but in his Tamil Pradhan stage, and he has to receive the knowledge of the Gita so that he is transformed into um, the highest, the one who is next to God, which means Krishna. Uh, Sister Denise, the next one is Keshni Sudan. So Keshni Sudan refers to a slayer of a demon, and so this would be the heroic um, warrior. So this is a reference to Arjuna. Uh, Arisudana. Arisudan, the destroyer of the enemy, again is a reference to uh, Arjuna, who's the only one who's fighting. But I think that this is an epithet given to Krishna, but then Krishna is um, maybe the destroyer of illusion. And so this may be a personification, otherwise it would be Arjuna who would be expected to be destroying the uh, enemy. Bhagwan. Bhagwan is a word that very specifically refers to God. So any Hindu who uses the word Bhagwan, um, is un it is understood that they think that Bhagwan means God. So Bhagwan literally means the um, creator of fortune or the giver of fortune. So yes, Bhagwan, God. Vasudev. So Vasudev is, um, uh, here is written that he is considered as the son of Vasudev. So Vasudev is a reference to Krishna. Uh, Prabhu, which um, the English translation reads, splendid one. Prabhu is also a word that is um, assigned to mean God, rather like Bhagwan, so Bhagwan, Prabhu. So in the prayers, in the Hindu prayers, when 
people are calling on God, they say, Oh Prabhu, in the way that we would say, Oh God. The next one, Sister Denise, is Mahabaho. Well, here uh, it's probably a reference to God in terms of the Almighty One, the one who has all the powers, uh, because it refers to the one who has all the, all the mighty arms. So I would think that this is a reference to God. But you see, there are times when God is personified. And this is one of the things that happens to Arjuna. He sees God in human form, and then he forgets he's God. And then he sees the, the universal form, and then he's scared. And then he says, no, I can't talk to you because you're too awe-inspiring. So then he becomes the friendly form of Krishna again. So, um, so you can see how there are complications involved in this because God um, operates through an incarnation and the incarnation hides the person of God. So then during the course of the Gita, he reveals his powerful form, then he has to hide it again because you can't interact with God in that form. You see. Yadav. This is interesting. Yadav, there are three clans. There's the Kauravs, uh, the Pandavs, and the Yadavs. And Krishna is said to be one of the Yadavs. And the Yadavs, as far as we can understand in uh, our studies um, with Brahma Kumaris, the Yadavs refer to the Europeans, the scientific community. So Krishna is said to be one of those. And uh, then um, the Kauravs refer to people who are very hedonistic, and the Pandavs, the little handful of people who are with God. So these are the different uh, groups of people who are arrayed uh, at the time of the Great World War. How then does um, Krishna side with the Pandavs? With the, for the war, because Arjuna is a Pandav. Arjuna is a Pandav, but... So does it not make sense that uh, Krishna would be speaking to the Yadav army and giving them everything? Well, the Yadavs are not on the Kurukshetra. You see, they're there, but in the Gita, you have the Kauravs and the Pandavs, the Yadavs somewhere else. And um, so the only sign of a Yadav is Krishna himself. And so it's confusing because the Yadavs are a clan in the human world. And then Krishna is supposed to be God and he can't be both. So it's a confusing um, description actually. Oh. And if he is not God and not a scientist, um, but he is a deity, then he wouldn't be appearing on the battlefield. Yes, it needs the word descendant. Um, when I saw this, I thought, can anyone have God as a descendant? Well, I mean, you can't. No, you can't. Okay. So this would then be, you know, this is the thing, these epithets sometimes clarify things and sometimes they make it more confusing. Purushottam? So Purushottam means the highest human. And so the highest human is really, um, in a way, Arjun. But then Purushottam cannot refer to somebody who is studying. Uh, so then it's assigned to Krishna. Uh, but Krishna is the one, or God, is the one who transforms a person from lowest to Purushottam. Mm. So the consequences of the um, knowledge of the Gita would be that Arjuna becomes Purushottam. And what you have here implied is that, you know, Arjuna, Brahma becomes Vishnu, Vishnu is Krishna. So you have this implication of the process of reincarnation where your first birth and your last birth are talking to each other. 
Yeah. Yeah, that is an interesting way of looking at it. Okay, so Mahatman, Mahatma. Mahatma, a great soul. So Mahatma, a great soul, usually that would be referring to Krishna. Yeah, okay. Vishnu. So Vishnu, um, definitely Vishnu is um, considered to be God and Krishna is a form of Vishnu. But then Vishnu has, Vishnu is the four-armed, so that is the male and female forms combined, forms of perfection. And they still have human form, or Vishnu has a human form, so uh, very often thought of as the combined form of Lakshmi and Narayan. So this is the consequences of God's uh, teachings, is to transform the ordinary person into a deity, which is also referred to in the Sikh scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib. Uh, De Deva Isa, Devasa. Devasa, uh, Lord of the Gods. It's rather like uh, Jupiter, Zeus, you know, the Lord, the, mm. the father of the gods. So this again would be referring to Shiva or Brahaspati, um, the, the seed of the tree, the the lord of all the gods. Anantarup. Anantarup. So that is definitely referring to incorporeal god because Anantarup means the one who whose form cannot be defined. So the infinite um, and so that is incorporeal god. Prajapati. Prajapati. Um, we have Prajapati or Prajapita. Mm. So we, in our teachings in Brahma Kumaris, we talk of Prajapita Brahma, the father of all the people. And uh, I think this is actually the same Lord of all the creatures, Lord of all the people. So this is referring to the first man, Adidev, uh, Adam, uh, Brahma. Yeah. Mm. This is Anise, the next one is Aprameya. So this is characterized as again the immeasurable, the infinite one. So that would refer to incorporeal God. Um, the next one you've got to help me with because I can pronounce it. Apratima Prabhav. Yeah, Apratima Prabhav. So it means the, the one whose influence is beyond comparison. Uh, the extraordinary one, the glorious one. So this refers certainly to incorporeal God if he can be perceived with all of his glory, all of his light. Uh, is some idiom? Yeah, is some idiom, um, this again refers to God. You know, it is said uh, in uh, our teachings in Brahma Kumaris that um, the praise, all praise goes to God. Um, people should not be praised because the only one who really does anything really significant is God. So by comparison, uh, people are lesser than God. And so in that sense, don't need to be praised. Mm -hmm. And Deva means God. Dev, yes. Well, Dev means a God with a little g. Oh, that's interesting. You have, um, well, you have a Devi, which is a goddess, and a Devta, sometimes called Dev or Devta, mm. God with a little g. Uh, this is nice. the last one I have for God is Sahasrabaho. So this refers to Brahma, Brahma, the one with a thousand arms. Mm -hmm. And so you see the um, issue here that we are dealing with is you have incorporeal God who uh, incarnates into a human form. Through that human form, teaches, gives the secret knowledge um, and then the result of that secret knowledge is the whole world is transformed. And so it becomes then the knowledge of the creator and the creation. So then comes the reference to Brahma. Uh, Brahma is called the one with a thousand arms because Brahma has to have a lot of people 
who help him. And so this is why we call ourselves Brahma Kumars and Kumaris. So we, we think that um, we are adopted children of the one who was given the title Brahma by the incorporeal Shiva, and then we need to um, apply the knowledge, we need to practice the yoga, and as a result of all this, um, there is change in the world. So this is how we think. Um, Sister Denise, that brings us to the end of the titles for God uh, slash Krishna. Uh, there are a number of epithets that are given to Arjuna throughout the Bhagavad Gita, but uh, all of them are fairly self-explanatory, so I don't think it's necessary that we go through that. There are two epithets for Arjuna that are of interest to me. Um, the first one is Dhananjay, the conqueror of wealth, uh, also referring to uh, Pandava. And the second one is, at some stage in the Bhagavad Gita, God called Arjuna Anag, meaning the blameless one, uh, which is, is kind of sweet. Uh, could you tell us what these titles mean uh, to you? And do they have a deeper meaning than just that which is seen and or taken at face value? Well, when you look at the story, um, the Pandavas had to go into the mountains, they had to be banished, they had to lose everything. They were quite willing to do that. And so it's quite interesting that this is connected with the whole question of being a renunciate. So not only a person who renounces the fruit of action, but also a person who renounces all of the fruits of status and so on. So I think this also talks to us about the quality of the person who is the student of God. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting, not only for Arjuna, but also for us. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, the blameless one, I think is very interesting because he was so concerned to do the right thing. And to call him the blameless one means and, he, and uh, God keeps on telling him, don't worry, do not grieve, you're okay, you've got a good destiny, just listen, just have faith, um, because you are all right, you are blameless. So that's really good. Sister Denise, I think that brings us to the end of this episode. So we have to say goodbye to you now. But uh, there are a few other discussions that you and I will be engaging in as far as the Bhagavad Gita is concerned. So we'll say goodbye for now, but we'll see you again soon. You. So there you go. Uh, Sister Denise has explained some of the titles that are contained in the Bhagavad Gita as far as the names and titles of God are concerned as well as Arjuna and um, it's interesting to know these words not just because of uh, them in context but each of these titles of both Arjuna and um, Sri Krishna slash God carry a meaning to it, a depth to it and it gives us um, fresh insight and a deeper understanding of what this book is all about. So Sister Denise, thank you for your sharing thank and you. thank you at home and we hope to see you soon. Take care. And goodbye.